the Apasa Pami sponsored session. And I'd like to welcome our panelists here, Dr. Kumaran from Chennai, Dr. Sugara Jain is here from Mumbai. So I think mainly this section will focus on uh, the Apasami, the new machines and the launches that they have been having and uh, also about their new extended depth of focus <coughs> IOLs and we have two prolific users here, Dr. Subira and Dr. Kumran who will be talking about that and any of you, basically we can make it interactive so any of you have any questions regarding the lenses and how it works and the machines, always feel free to ask. I think we'll start in another two minutes. Oh, we'll wait for another couple of minutes and then we'll go ahead with it. <laughs> we can start, sir. We can start, sir. We'll go ahead. Nibian here. So the first talk of the day is going to be by Dr. Nivian, who's going to talk on uh, orbit faker emulsification in challenging cases with the latest generation extended depth of focus IOL from the Apasami company. It's called, uh, called the Supraphobin Focus. Uh, so he, he's going to show us a, uh, a sequence of surgical videos. I have two videos here, so I'll split it up. The Apasami TurboWit machine, the, or the TurboWit Orbit, actually has both the anterior segment module and the posterior segment module in the same machine. So that's the beauty of this machine with a single cassette system. So you don't have to change for anterior segment and then when you want to do a vitrectomy you don't have to change. So the first video I'm going to show is the FACO being done on that same machine and now they've come up with a new handpiece crystal, that six electric piece crystal and it is officially one of the lightest hand pieces that is available in the market right now throughout the world actually. So please ask for a demo, use it and then you will believe how light it is like your pencil. So I thought I'll just show you one case of a mature cataract which is always very challenging for all FACO surgeons no matter how experienced you become and then when you have to do a premium IOL like a multifocal or an in-focus lens in this patient that he had asked for. So the rexis is one of the most key steps in any cataract surgery that we all of us know. So getting the rexis right was the first challenge for me in this case. I am not fortunate enough to have a femto cataract machine with me but right now we've got the zepto and all of us know it is the last under the subcapsular area where usually the rexus turns to run away. So that's where we should always be careful. I'm just showing this video just to highlight one small technique what you can do is I always shift because the angle is little difficult with your wrist to complete the rexus. So always you can shift, go inside and refill the antre chamber. It is sometimes only when the antre chamber actually collapses that the rexus runs away. When the antre chamber pressure is always maintained, it always has a pressure on the capsule so it prevents it from running away. So that's a small mistake that we all tend to do. So always fill the elastic. And the third thing is, now you have a rexus that is trying to run away but it is still not gone outside. See once it goes outside, it's a different ball game. So now the only difference you have to do is you use the force towards the center and not the routine way how you do the rexus. If you can see, I'm grasping the rexus and the entire force or almost it's like in a reverse direction. Not only in the center but it, you can do it in the reverse direction. And then you can see that U-turn of the rexus and then I was able to complete it. But for a second, you always have your heart in your mouth when you have to do these premium IOLs in these patients. The choice of echo emulsification, I think whatever the surgeon is comfortable, I think whether you're doing the divide and conquer technique, I'm uh, usually a stop and chop technique guy, not the direct chop. So whichever technique you're comfortable with, I think that's the best technique. The only key that here is the chamber maintenance has become better in these machines. As you can see, how what we talk about chamber maintenance, the iris flutter. If you can see the iris, it does not flutter. So that shows you about how the stability of the machines are. So this absolutely abolishes the surge. As you can see, this is the new intraocular lenses that I think the other speakers are going to talk about. So I'm not going to go into the details of the lens. It's just called the in-focus lens, which has an extended depth of focus. And this is patented by Apasami, this thing. So basically, this is also a hydrophobic lens, the 360 degree square edge. It's got the central ring that's responsible for the near vision ad. They have a zone of the near vision ad. So the only advantage here is they're trying to eliminate all the side effects that the multifocal has because of the multiple rings and the loss of light that happens and the glare and the, uh, the patient has. So it's not saying that there will not be any glare or halos, but we're trying to reduce that effect because basically it is a unifocal lens with a central ad. And this design is purely patented by Apasami. So as you can see, a well-centered lens in the end of the day. 
the key here again for any lens is you need an overlap of the anterior capsular margin over the IOL. So that is what prevents the PCO also formation, not only the material of the lenses that you use. So as I said, I just split my video. So this is the anterior segment video. I think we'll move on to the next, uh, can we play the next video? Or eight video. So as I said before, this machine, basically you can do both surgeries with the same machine at the same time without changing, ca oh, you can change the video or you don't have to prime the machine. So where it is useful for anterior segment surgeons is on table when you have a rupture, all you have to do is just change your mode to the vitrectomy mode and then you have a cutter in your hand which has 7000 cuts per minute to do your anterior vitrectomy also. So it is not that you have to prime the machine or call the staff again when you have a rupture. So you, so this is a case of a simple retinal detachment that we did in this yeah. machine. We have all types of trocars available in Apasami. So this is the 23 gauge valve system also. And there is a special design of the stellate tip which has increased sharpness. So we put in a lot of effort designing this. And also we have the marking at the back 3 and the 4 millimeters. So these valve systems are also available that prevents this black flow of the fluid. So you don't have to use those plugs anymore. The biome system is also available with all the lenses. They have the wide angle lens and also the 90 diopter lens. So this is the new turbo orbit machine that I was talking about. As you can see in the screen, what's new here is they have increased the vacuums up to 600 right now and you have cut rates of almost out up to 8000. But I think uh, they keep innovating every time. So they have now the new bi-blade cutters also which can cut both sides. So even at 4000 cut rates, you can see the sound actually. This is an external video. This is not you have these bi-blade cutters so it cuts when it goes forward and also when it comes back so you're almost multiplying the number of cut rates that's actually happening this is actually a video from the external camera you can see i just wanted to show the sound of the machines have also improved so no longer apasami is a slow machine i think they're almost in par with the constellation because i use all the three systems so i'm not afraid to do my primary vitrectomies with these so this is you can see the peripheral vitreous that i'm trying to trim so why we am trying to emphasize here is you see there is no worry about going close to the retina even at very high speeds and very high vacuums you are absolutely confident and one more small things because of the valves that they are having is you see how stable the vitreous chamber is also there. So you can see the tear flap in the peripheral there so you can go very close to these flaps and trim absolutely all the vitreous that is there without worrying about the retina getting caught. So you have very high speed systems and very stable machines that let us do good surgeries. Once this happens, the surgeon itself feels very confident. So this is just to complete, you have the SR of drainage and you have the oil injection also being done. So this was the pre-op picture of this particular patient. And then this was the post-op picture at one month. So these machines have both these advantages. So that is what I'm trying to say. Basically, you can do both your FACO surgeries and your high-end vitrectomy surgeries in one machine. And that's it. So any of you here in the audience already using the machine or you have any other questions or doubts, you can always ask. I think the panel will answer. Any doubts, any thing that you want to know about the machine or the surgery? Uh, does this, uh, uh, the Apasami, the posterior segment machine, uh, does it have an integrated green laser with them? Yeah, so they have a step down version and now they have an upgraded version where they have integrated the green laser also. And now they are planning on having the Zepto module which is in the R&D process. So you will have a system where you can do your Zepto Rexes, your green laser and the vitrectomy in one unit. Okay, so once we don't have any questions, I think we'll move on to the next uh, uh, talk. So you're going to speak about your experience with the uh, superphobin focus, yes? Yes. All right. I think the Apasami has a lucky draw after the end of this uh, uh, talk. So I will request all of them to stay behind. So how many in the audience have been using this in focus I will? Not too many. So there are very few. So I think uh, this talk is going to be interesting for them.
Is the audio cable connected? Just okay. to an update also, they have come up with one more new machine that is also the gravity based, like how you have the Centurion of the Alcon system. So I think that is also there in the stall. So if you have time, you can visit that. So that's a machine that is gravity based. So it doesn't depend on the bottle height. So you can set the IOP that you want to operate in. And it also has the bottle. So in case you don't have this, you can use that. So it's a dual system. It's called the Apasami Leo, huh? Shiva? Yes. It's called the Leo or Neo? The Leo. The Leo. Uh, a good afternoon and a warm welcome to all the delegates and my co-speakers. I'm going to talk on my experience with the InFocus IOL and its design. Uh, I see a couple of years back when the Apasami company came out with these lenses, I had my own doubts. What is the need to bring in another multifocal IOL when the uh, market has already been flooded with multiple uh, multifocal IOLs? But if you would see, there's always a little bit of uh, the surgeon, as with the patient, do take these IELTS with a pinch of salt. The surgeon is always afraid whether the re post-operative refractor errors would be there, and the patient is always scared of these glass and halos. So because of these reasons, uh, the surgeon and the patients do not take the multifocal IOL at the first point of choice. So uh, this in-focus IOL addresses these two factors, both for the surgeon and the patient, in making them uh, both of them comfortable. I uh, have no financial interest with these lenses, and uh, as the old saying goes, uh, know your patient before you start treating him, and I would modify it by saying know your IOL before you know your patient, and find to uh, try to find the right patient for this right IOL. Uh, all the multifocal IOL do not work well for most of the patients, so you really have to decide what are the patient's needs, know your IOL before you choose your patient. Uh, the main reason why the multifocal IOLs are not brought into focus, a small touch of the physics part. The multifocal IOLs, the incident rays of light are split into two, and when one particular uh, focus is in focus, the other uh, focal point is out of focus, which, uh, uh, which causes glare and halos. This is one of the reasons why most of the patients do not go for the multifocal IOLs. This is a, uh, an animation to show how these uh, multifocal and monofocal IOLs work. But the difference with the EDOF lens is that this is an animation to show how the uh, extended depth of focus IOL works. The extended depth of focus IOL, to talk in technical terms, has a face coded technology and it synchronizes all the light rays that are split uh, into an elongated focal point. Chinese. So basically it does not uh, uh, produce a single focus, rather elongates the focus. Chinese. So this is how the monofocal light works. All the light rays are directed through the distant foci, so there's no glare and halos, and it produces a single focal point. In a bifocal, the light rays are split depending upon different IOLs, and it leads to a, a double focal point, which results in glare and halos. The extended depth of focal IOLs has a multiple diffractive rings on the posterior surface, which uh, elongates the focus. The diffractive rings on the surface are designed in such a way that the uh, uh, diffracted light are synchronous with each other. They are not brought into focus, but the focal point is elongated to give you an elongated depth of focus. Uh, this can be equated to the compact disc or the normal CD disc which we see across. When you just move the CD disc, you will see a lot of rays being uh, reflected like that. So the EDOF lens is something similar to a compact disc. So this is how the uh, uh, diffracted light rays from the posterior surface of the uh, IOL are brought into focus, rather elongation of focus happens. And this results in much less glare and halos. Uh, the other important feature of the EDOF lens is ability to correct the chromatic abrasion. As all of us know, the uh, the lens with the maximum Abbe number is the normal PMMA lens, which has the highest Abbe number and thus causes less of chromatic abrasion. Uh, the, uh, as among the hydrophobic uh, lenses, the uh, EDOF lenses have a very good uh, chromatic abrading uh, uh, correcting capability. This adds to around two diopters of focus, which could uh, further add on to the depth of focus by these uh, lenses. The other important feature is that as as all of us know about the Strum's conoid, uh, the elongated focus uh, by the Adolf lenses covers the Strum's conoid. Hence, even when you have a post-operative astigmatic refractive error, these lenses are 
uh, less forgiving because it covers the entire uh, Strum's conoid. Uh, one need to understand the defocus curve, which is unique for these lenses. Whenever you correct a patient uh, to be emetropic and, you, and when you add on a plus 5 or a plus 1 diopter lens in the trial frame, most of these patients with monofocal or multifocal IOLs have a drop in vision. But this doesn't happen so with the supraphobe in focus, uh, which is called the uh, defocus curve. When these patients are are emetropic and you add on a plus 5 or a plus 1 diopter, the patients still have a useful range of vision. This is very uh, helpful clinically because when you are off the target by a couple of diopters too, the patient usually do not complain because the ability of these lens to elongate the focus and accommodate for the uh, a prediction error. Uh, the, uh, the, the lens also has a, a very good light di a distribution for distance and near, which accounts for around 85% for distance and 16 in a, a 3 millimeter pupil. And when it comes down, to around 40%, which is directed to the uh, near, which is quite good for uh, multifocal IOL. So as you would uh, know, there are multiple multifocal IOLs available in the market, which is from pure diffractive IOLs to a refractive, diffractive, epidized or a non-epidized IOL, and also the latest generation trifocal IOLs, which are either epidized or non-epidized. So the EDOF lenses uh, come under a total different category. They come under the refractive and a diffractive extended depth of focus IOL. As you would see, uh, this lens has a central 1.67 millimeter zone I could as you could see the picture in picture, which is a photograph taken from inside the patient's eye. The central 1.67 millimeter of lens has a 3.3 diopter add in the IOL plane, which has a refractive element incorporated into it. The remaining part of the lens have multiple diffractive rings, where the profile of the diffraction rings are directed in such a way that the light rays have a uh, complementary technology and brings the elongation of focus. Normally, when you uh, see these lenses on the normal magnification when you do surgery, it does look like a normal monofocal lens, as Dr. Nivian has uh, said. But when you do it at a higher magnification, you're able to uh, see the diffractive rings on the uh, lenses, which is a speciality of these lenses. And I think one needs to have a very meticulous approach to uh, to go ahead with the EDOF lenses. I normally tell my uh, students or uh, uh, or who want to start a multifocal practice, always get your prediction error right by implanting the complementary monofocal IOL before you embark in doing a, a multifocal IOL. This is true for any case. For example, you want to put an in focus, at least do a couple, uh, say, or 10, 20 cases of the suprafob com uh, component, refine your prediction error before you go ahead and do a multifocal IOL. Understand the patient's uh, needs. These lenses work very well for 40 centimeters onwards, but if you're going to uh, need a patient who needs very good vision, less than 40 centimeters, I would advise them to go for a mismatch where you could put a traditional diffractive IOL in one eye and go for an EDOF in the other eye, which the uh, gives them good range of vision. There's always a debate how to put in a different technologies in different IOLs, but believe me, I have a, a lot of patients where I have done this and uh, most of them are very happy. So this uh, next point for a successful EDOF lens uh, surgery is a proper biometry. If you're able to get your hands on to an optical biometer, do it because the optical biometers are 10 times more accurate than an immersion biometer and 100 times more accurate than a uh, contact biometer. Use the latest uh, uh, fourth generation formulas which take the elective lens position into consideration like the uh, Olsen's, uh, uh, the Barrett's 2K, the Holiday, or, or even the RBF uh, formula. Do not put these lenses when you have a preoperative astigmatism of 0.75 and above. However, the upper thumb does not have a charic in focus lens as for now. This probably would be down the line. And if you have a refractive error in one of the eyes, always refine the IOL power in the other eyes. So these uh, uh, factors need to be kept in mind. The, surger uh, the surgery factors are not uh, uh, much because all of us are are excellent cataract surgeons. The only thing I want to highlight is uh, get a properly placed rexis. Look for the angle kappa. If it's more than 0.5, do not go ahead with these lenses. Uh, the prediction error internationally, you should aim at a prediction error of less than one diopter. So this is an unpublished data, which according to a single center, which is done by me at uh, Kumbhra Nai Specialty Center, Chennai, we had 106 implanted eyes. And uh, 
106Is, we had 45 of them were bilateral and 16 were unilateral. We had uh, around 60% of the female distribution, the ranges of age from 32 to 76 years. Uh, senile cataracts was predominant. We did have one person who had a traumatic cataract. We did implant these lens. We measured there uh, at one month, we had a, a standard distant visual acuity near and intermediate. And we were uh, uh, recorded the uh, data at one month post-op. We found that around 43.4% had a 6.6 six unaided vision and equal number with 6.9. So this accounts to almost 87% uh, of patients who had an unaided distant visual acuity. Uh, and uh, 6.12 uh, vision was found in 13.2 patients. Uh, we recorded the uh, residual spherical error in all the 106 cases, and we found that 67% of the patient had a, a plano refraction at one month post-op, and around 23% of them had less than 0.75 uh, spherical error. Uh, we, uh, we did have a few refractive surprises in 1.88% of, uh, uh, of the people. Uh, the cylindrical error, as noted here, around 42.53% of the people did not have any cylindrical error, but however, less than 0.75 was noted in a significant number of people. But as you said, because his lens uh, is less forgiving, uh, even if the patient has around 0.75 diopters uh, of residual astigmatism, they do not complain and they have a good, excellent vision. The near vision was good in more than 90% of the cases, and around 13.2% of the people had N8 or better. And finally, we had 45 bilateral implants, and we gave glasses to only 3% uh, among the fiber implant, and most of the glasses were given only for distant vision, and, and, and none of these patients had problems with the near vision because we didn't land up with a, uh, with a hyperopic refractive error. When we went ahead and asked these patients by a questionnaire at the end of one month whether they had any glass and halos, most of them said yes, they had glass and halos, but uh, it was not practically significant and were able to carry on with a normal work uh, without any problem. Thank you. So at the end, I would say the in-focus lens is something a surgeon need not get worried about these glass and halos. They can go ahead and implant them uh, without Sina? this uh, scare. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumaran. Any questions in the audience? People are already using the multifocal lenses. Any questions? Uh, see, some patients, see, these lenses do not work very well if they want a good vision less than 40 centimeters. So, we are, uh, so in that case, I had to give them a traditional diffractor plus 4 or a plus 3.5 diopter add. And to reduce the glare and halos, and also they, these uh, traditional uh, diffractor lenses do not have very good vision in the intermediate range. So, uh, whereas the EDOF lens would give you a good intermediate vision from 40 centimeter onwards. And that's the reason I... I did this. So the other option could be uh, implanting a trifocal also. So, <laughs> so I think next we'll have uh, Dr. Subira Jain with us, who's going to talk about her experience and the high definition technology I will through her eyes. So before she sets up, I think we have a lucky draw also here. So I request Dr. Kumaran here to pick up and announce the name. So the lucky uh, person here is Dr. Srinivasan from Chennai. Dr. Srinivasan, if you can come. So he's been the lucky Shivanyam, person. What, what is that, Shivanyanam? Huh? So and that's a two-mirror gonioscope. get a two-mirror gonioscope. Yeah. Right? I think so we have uh, one more uh, draw after, uh, two more draws to be taken after the end of the session. So anybody wants the name picked up, please message me. Huh? <laughs> Does faculty get to apply as well? Do we? No? Okay. We have a special gift. Oh, yeah, of course. Right. So uh, with a view to evaluate the performance of this lens, the superphobe in focus, we performed a study 
in which we aimed at evaluating the visual performance or the visual of the in-focus lens. When we looked at the visual performance, what we looked at was the visual acuity, the contrast sensitivity, the range of vision, the induced aberrations, the, and the subjective appreciation of any post-operative photic phenomena, as well as whether the patient was satisfied or no. Right, we've gone into the details about what this lens is like and how it performs. Uh, all patients who presented to us with a visually significant cataract were included in the study. I mean, it is a small study, but we looked at 15 eyes of 11 patients who operated in the year 2016. Male to female ratio was two is to five, and we had a one year follow up, up to one year of a follow up. All surgeons, surgeries were performed by a single surgeon sitting superiorly at 65 degrees with a 2.8 millimeter incision. If it was a bilateral implantation, it, it was a second surgery was performed a month later. Right? And the only patients that were excluded are those who had any comorbid conditions, like anything to do with glaucoma or any other maculopathies, post uveitic eyes, post traumatic eyes, and polar cataracts, which had any pre existing posterior capsular opening, were also excluded in the study. In order to evaluate the performance, what we actually ended up looking at was these were the different things. We looked at the vision, the contrast, the intermediate vision, the patient satisfaction, and whether or not the patient actually required spectacles be used post operatively. Uh, Preoperatively, we, uh, all these patients, and even the ones we've done after that, we always do an optical biometry, and I think it is important when you're looking at premium IOLs that you get your spherical bang on. And we used the Lens Star, which we have at our institute. We also used the company advised A constant, optical A constant of 118.8. And of course, we don't always get something to zero. So we went closest to zero on the minus side. And that's what we chose at our lens power. The visual acuity was tested like we all do worldwide with Snell and Acuity system of testing of visual acuity. Uh, the contrast sensory like uh, Sir's presentation, we also use the mass contrast sensitivity chart, which consists of a series of three, which is, this is what it's done, kept at a distance of 50 meters when the uh, background ambient illumination is set with a lux meter at 264 kind of luxes, and uh, with the reading glasses in place, and then the patient reads a set of three different near vision charts, and, uh, you know, with a small mathematical calculation, we figure out what is the log contrast sensitivity. And then we looked at the intermediate vision. I think the most interesting thing in cataract surgery today is what range of vision are we able to get give the patient. And therefore, I think it's very important for us to understand what is this deep focus curve. Now, the best way and the most practical and easy way to evaluate the range of intermediate vision is by plotting the deep focus curve. Okay? Now, Plotting the defocus curve works on the refractive principle that f is equal to 1 by d, where f is the focal length in meters, and d is the diopters of accommodation. Therefore, to see clearly at 1 meter, you need 1 diopter of accommodation. It would also thereby mean that if the person is seeing clearly at 1 meter, either he's got, with his distance correction in place, either this pseudophagic patient is, uh, is, is uh, inducing one, either the lens is inducing a diopter of pseudo accommodation, or there's a plus 1 add. But when we are looking at the range of vision, we should talk vision rather than diopters. So therefore, we plot this curve. I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, I mean, we plot the graph, okay, wherein the, the horizontal axis is the range of vision and the vertical axis the visual acuity. If you see zero right at the bottom, do you have a pointer here? I'm sorry, it's yeah. not very clear. So, yeah. well, uh, it's okay. Yeah, with the whatever distance correction of the sphero cylinder that he requires. After that, uh, you keep placing minus 0.5 lenses in front of his eye, and you read off what the patient sees. So go back again. If you look at the fourth point here, if, uh, if, you, get, if you add minus 1.5 and you take the same f is equal to 1 by d, you're checking the patient's vision at 66 centimeters. So in the graph here, this is 0. When you put a minus 0.5, it's checking it at 2 meters. When you put a minus 1, you're checking the vision at 1 meter. When you're looking at, um, when you place a minus 1.5, you're checking the vision at 66 centimeters. What is his distance vision that he can hold at 66 centimeters is what you achieve when you place a minus 1.5. And you can work your way down. So at 2, you're checking the vision at 50 centimeters. 
with a minus two and a half at 40. So you see beyond any walls of doubt, it gives you a clear, crisp representation of what the patient sees. Um, I, I'm just going to show you an implantation of the lens. I don't really need to, but it's um, an easy to use lens, I find. Uh, I think I'll show you the next video. It's more interesting. So this is the loading and the placement of the, um, bring it up to the incision and uh, loading the lens with significant ease within the capsular bag. And I think, uh, yeah, the main aim of showing you this video is not the ease of loading and insertion, but I think it, it, you can notice how well it really centers. If you look at the first and the third Purkinje image, you know, you, you coincide the first and third Purkinje image and you find a brilliant centration of the lens. Uh, this is a surgery I did in, it was a live surgical session in Bhopal, and I was brave enough thinking, okay, I'll do a polar cataract. And towards the end of, uh, towards the second half, I, to my dismay, I actually saw those the linear cattle track kind of openings in the posterior capsule. And this was a surgery where I had planned to actually put in a supraphobe in focus. And um, uh, fortunately for me, with adequate care, with a dispersive viscoelastic, I ended up removing all the cortical material after removing the nucleus. And I thought I can be brave enough, because there was no vitreous disturbance, to actually attempt placing the IOL within the capsular bag at right angles to the uh, to the to the opening and you see even uh, it was quite possible to even do this here's the lens in the capsular bag in a, a fairly stable capsular bag and you've got it at right angles to the opening so I, now I'd like to just take a few minutes to share with you the results of our study right when we looked at the visual acuity of these patients out of the total number of 15 eyes 33% uh, of the patients were completely bang on plano and if we took the total, and if we just looked at the cylinders, a small cylinder of about 0.5 or 0.75 was seen in another 46. So 80% of our patients had a spherical, uh, was spherical almost bang on, few had a cylinder. So there were only 20% of the patients were off by just about 0.5 diopter of, of a sphere. Making, a, uh, making us realize that obviously clearly our optical biometer, the A constants were fine. When we looked at the contrast sensitivity, and I was pretty new into contrast sensory, wondering what do these figures really mean, right? So I went on to, we took about six to eight to 10 pe patients of the different age groups. Uh, the first without cataracts and then those with early cataracts, right? And we looked at what is their log contrast sensitivity. So the only point I need you to remember here is, uh, for someone who's going into uh, in the early 40s and beyond, the average contrast was about 1.5, and someone in the fifth decade, it was about 1.5-ish again, right? So when we looked at the log contrast sensitivity of these patients, the almost 60% of patients had the log contrast sensitivity of someone in the fourth decade, right? Someone who's 40 and without with a clear lens. And another 20% were or had a log contrast sensitivity in 1.5 and 1.59. So the contrast sensitivity, which is one element in, I think, in cataract practice is what you don't bargain for. And uh, you don't bargain with even for anything else that a lens may offer to you, I think is what we are able to maintain here, okay? And this is the other way in which we use the eye trace extensively to look at the, uh, the MTF, which is also a measure of the contrast. And if you draw a line from here to here, it should be more than 0.4 signifying a good contrast. And now we looked at the defocus curves. Uh, this is what we got. I'll just explain this to you. So here you go. Here's a patient. Um, one sec, where's this? Yeah. At zero, corrected for distance. Whatever was a little bit of an error, the patient could see 6-6. Six, six. But so... When you see a defocus curve that looks like this, you have a patient who's maintaining good vision from infinity, which is optical infinity, which is 6.6, six, right through till 2.5, which is about 33, uh, which is about 40 centimeters, right? So giving you a brilliant range of intermediate vision. The next case, I mean, he just went on and on. He just could see very clearly. Some of them give you a bit of, uh, a, bit of a drop, but what is considered as a gold standard is anything equal to above six by 12 is acceptable as good vision, right? So um, this is what we found. We looked at nabrometry postoperatively to see, it, th these are the internal optics, to see whether the lens is creating any kinds of optical aberrations which might be visually dissatisfying to the patient and we didn't find any. Um, and I think overall, uh, out of our uh, 15 eyes, largely 13, were, they were very, very happy with the end result. Two that were dissatisfied, only the two that were a little dissatisfied, one who had a bit of a spherical residue and he thought that was annoying, and one of them who thought that he required too much light for reading, 
right? So in discussion, I think the points I would like to make is for all of us, irrespective of which lens we choose, I think the time has come to understand and address the fact that intermediate is the new near. It's no longer 40 centimeters. All of us and all that we do and all that we ever will do, whether it's signing checks or make a cup of tea or looking at our food while we eat or counting money or putting our key through a keyhole or looking at all our tabs and all our devices that everyone is almost always on, it is going to be the range of vision that we need to see is more in the intermediate range, which is anywhere between about 50, 60, 70, 80 centimeters. And therefore, when we choose the lens we want to choose one that takes care of the intermediate visual needs of every particular patient one at a time right and then when we evaluated it we found that 80 percent of our in focus group had an intermediate vision which was acceptable and not only acceptable it was pretty damn good right uh, also the optical biometry using the a constant that was given to us we were able in 80 percent to have uh, almost no spherical uh, residue um, and then when we looked at the contrast sensory, we found that 66% of patients in the in-focus group had a vision, a vision which was comparable to someone in the fourth decade, and 25% were those uh, of those had a contrast comparable to someone in the fifth decade with a clear lens. All patients were very happy with their near vision, but I must state, like any other multifocal lens, almost all of them did require bl bright light for reading. No one really required gla glasses for near work. Thus, I would like to conclude in saying the in-focus lens did very well with respect to the corrected distance, intermediate, and near visual acuity and contrast sensitivity, exhibited a good range of intermediate vision, did not exhibit any lasting photic phenomena, and other than requiring bright light for near work, left extremely satisfied patients. Thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Subira. I think uh, that was very interesting. There's one more interesting take-home message that I would do. One, it takes a lot of guts to do a posterior polar cataract on a live surgery session. And the second most important thing is when she had the rupture, if you notice, she didn't withdraw her instruments. So she told us that there was no vitreous. But the reason for that being that every time she came out, she injected visco through her other hand, made sure that the bag is maintained and there's no collapse of the anterior chamber. It's only when you collapse the anterior chamber, pulling out the instruments in a hurry, does the vitreous thrust forward. And you could see she did it even while exchanging her hands using the bimanual. She again patiently injected viscoelastics. So this is one of the most important, I think, take-home messages that you could do from today's video. Excellent video. Uh, Dr. Suveda, how do you counsel your patients for the in-focus? Do you have any special counseling things for them? or? Uh, I think, I think uh, rather than counseling my patients for in-focus, I counsel my patients, um, and I take a lot of time, in figuring out what their visual <coughs> needs are. Okay, and, and I let them understand the merit of having a relatively spectacle independent life, a relatively spectacle independent life. So at least when they wake up in the morning, they can look at their WhatsApp, they can look at their cup of tea, look at everything. And, and so, so I, I don't jump into just counseling them for the in focus or for a technus multifocal. My, my aim would be first and foremost to see what their visual needs are. And if they are likely to consider going in for a lens wherein they can uh, not need their glasses the first thing in the morning when they get up. That's when I move towards this. And if I had to take it a bit further, what I would actually talk to them about is, um, uh, and I think, I mean, I think I basically I tell them that, look, you make the choice. Are you happy to wear glasses for reading? Are you, or would you rather live a life the rest of your life? Because what I put in now is going to be there for the rest of your life. Would you rather just, you know, be able to get up and get on with your day. And I find that a lot of people, and it's not only people who are very, very rich, everybody, even people at home, people, retired people at home, they want to be able to get on with all of that. The only thing I would tell, ask, and which would may be a deterrent to considering a lens like this is, if patients were those who drove a lot at night, had a lot of night driving, I would ask them, would they mind giving it up for six months? And many do, you know? Or, and I think other than that, there really is uh, nothing else. And of course, they're very fussy. I tell them, oh, no, you, you go ahead with whatever you want. So before Dr. Rajesh sets up his practice, one more question. Do you decide, uh, or do you believe on the ocular dominance? Do you check your patients for ocular dominance before you put in an IOL, um, or you do not uh, take that into consideration? Um, if I'm planning, say, an in-focus in both eyes, I don't think. I think ocular dominance for me, yeah. I don't do it routinely, but if I, if I were to 
um, consider a lens wherein I need to have a compromise for either distance in one eye and intermediate in another eye, like something like the symphony does, then yes. Okay. But otherwise, no. So now we invite the next speaker, Dr. Rajesh, to call a clinical analysis of under eyes implanted within focus eye well. To you, Dr. Rajesh. Yeah. Thanks a lot uh, for inviting me here. Uh, now, uh, basically, I will start from the time when you know we started putting the IOL. It was Harold Ridley who first implanted the IOL, and then from then onwards, a lot of advancements have been done, and uh, a lot of advancement in terms of material design and IOL delivery. And the basic idea was to have a persistent six by six vision or the best vision that we can have. And we achieved also uh, over the years, but then there were issues regarding uh, patient wanting to be a spectacle free and then came the concept of these multifocal lenses and then multifocal lenses, they came up, there are a lot of issues, a lot of problems then, uh, but then a current generation multifocal lenses came up, it, there were a lot of advancements and then there was a reasonably good vision for distance and near with even these multifocals or bifocal lenses to, to be more precise. Uh, however, there were a lot of issues in terms of uh, intermediate vision because uh, most of us now are into laptops and computers where an intermediate vision is an issue which is 60 to 80 centimeter and from then these extended range of vision came into being and then uh, people started thinking of you know intermediate vision as well because of the computer distance and all that and b the basic idea is to uh, the basic uh, mechanism by which, by which it works is that it extends the depth of focus and uh, it is uh, it elongates the focal area instead of having multiple foci of like uh, uh, you know a bifocal lens one foci for distance and one for near and uh, so this is uh, one supra four wind focus lens which is an extended range of vision lens uh, in which the depth of focus is elongated it's not the, it's not the single point it has a specific design obviously you all uh, must have discussed about it i will be very short in this it has a specific design a central zone of 1.2 millimeter diameter uh, which is primarily for near and intermediate vision with ads of 3.5 and then from uh, from 1.2 on onwards, it is basically for the different distance and uh, different uh, range of distance. And basically, it works on transmission of light. As the pupil becomes bigger, the transmission of light is more for distance. And as the pupil becomes small, the transmission of light is more for near. And it has an elongated defocus curve. And uh, that's why it gives a range of vision. And so we just wanted to test this hypothesis, test this uh, this claim actually, that uh, whether it does have an extended depth of focus, whether it does have a good near and distance vision or not. And we did a study in which we included 55 patients. The basic idea was to do a study of 50 patients, uh, 100 eyes, but we just added five more. So it was 55 patients with bilateral implantation of supra in focus, and we had just had thought of, uh, you know, we thought that if five will be, you know, uh, not uh, five patients will not follow up, so we'll have at least 50 patients. So three patients did not follow up properly, actually. And so out of which one patient who was quite old had uh, some uh, cardiac arrest and died. So we had f uh, 52 patients with 104 eyes uh, with complete data, wherein uh, the follow-up period was, we had followed up for five to six months, but uh, we evaluated data up to three months only because that was good enough. And in all the patients, we had done a temporal clear corneal incision of 2.2 millimeter for phaco emulsification and subsequently for implantation of the eye well, we enlarged it to 2.8. Uh, <coughs> now, <coughs> this is uh, how we did. This is a temporal clear corneal incision and uh, capsular excess being performed, hydro procedure, and then Fecal massification and fecal completed and cortical aspiration done. And once there was complete cortical aspiration, the eye was set for eye implantation. Now at this stage, uh, since we performed fecal massification by 2.2 millimeter incision, we uh, I enlarged the uh, the the incision uh, by a 2.8 millimeter blade to make it 2.8 so that the tip of the 
of the cartridge goes inside the anterior chamber and then uh, the IOL was implanted in the bag and the, the, uh, what I felt that it was very easy to implant the uh, IOL goes well, it, a decent cartridge and, uh, and uh, the lens center as well in position. And once it was done, viscoelastic uh, was aspirated out, and uh, then um, the wound was hydrated, and we just uh, uh, checked the centration of the eye well. It centered well, and that was it. Now um, we uh, evaluated. We, we uh, if the distance uh, postoperatively, we uh, evaluated patients on day one, one week, one month, and three months. And we had uh, the distance chart by ETDRS, the uh, near chart, the Roman test type near vision chart, and the intermediate chart is a Sloan letter intermediate distance chart. Uh, this is, okay, they have to, do you have any other speaker? Or we just it's just you, one. it's just oh. you, Rajesh. Okay, okay. So, uh, so uh, we had, uh, the intermediate vision was taken by Sloan letter intermediate distance chart and this is something which is meant specifically for intermediate vision and uh, very few studies have been done using this. So, I am extremely thankful to Appasami and Shiva and Mr. Ramurti for providing this uh, Sloan letter intermediate distance chart and also the Mars contrast chart and the pupillometer to measure the pupil size so as to know exactly uh, whether the patient has any issues with a scotopic pupil size or the mesopic pupil size. And then uh, stereoacuity was also evaluated and refraction, uh, defocus curve plot and then uh, the patient, uh, these are the follow up periods. So this is how we did the pupillometry. This is the pupillometer, uh, this is how it was done. So. Uh, just go. What are you evaluating here, Rajesh? Explain this to us. Yeah, it is actually, uh, I, I could have shown a pupil, uh, um, sorry, the image of the pupillometer I'm not showing, but uh, basically the idea is to, uh, it's hung there. So basically the idea is to uh, measure the pupil size a with light and yeah, with uh, dim light. So, mesopic pupil size and the, uh, and the uh, uh, photopic pupil size. And uh, I will tell you later, based on that, we did the aberration study. Mm. Okay. And the basic idea was this, that whether this patient will have an aberration, as you were mentioning just now, nighttime vision and nighttime aberrations, etc. So, uh, we just wanted to know exactly whether, uh, what is the pupil size in the dim light with the pupillometer in this patient and uh, uh, w what is his problem, visual acuity and all that. So, we want, just wanted to know whether he will have any problem in uh, dim illumination, whether he will have problem in driving or not. Now, we had, uh, this is the age and gender, uh, we had 27 males and 25 females out of 52. And uh, the post-op visual acuity you can see at three months, the logmar visual acuity is, uh, uh, this is the uncorrected visual acuity of 0.11, which is, and best factor is 0 0.02. So it's 0 0.1 means uh, uh, it is 6-6 uh, vision. So th this is close to 6-6 vision as far as distance vision is concerned. As far as the intermediate uh, vision is concerned, the, uh, it is again quite close to uh, what we should have at 66 centimeter. It is, uh, so in a way on an average you can say it was between N6 to N8 on an average. Some patients had N8 and uh, majority of patients had N6 vision. Actually uh, this evaluation has been done, uh, analysis has been done just uh, four or five days back only, so I am not able to present the whole data wherein I have, you know, exact number of patients with N6 vision, with uh, intermediate uh, vision, all that, but this is the mean value that I am presenting. Uh, then as far as near vision is concerned, here you can see at three months time, 103 eyes of out of 104 had N6 vision. Only one patient, uh, one individual had N8, so that was remarkable actually. And uh, 
now here at this point of time only I would like to tell you that uh, you know when we started doing in the first uh, one or two cases we took the first myopic on IOL master as the target refraction. Say on IOL master if I was uh, getting uh, minus 0 0.25 so I was taking that value as the IOL power. On one or two first uh, 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 just one or two cases initially on day one uh, I felt there was some refractive error and the patient had uh, N8 and 6-9 uh, vision. So I j and, and then on uh, when we did the refraction it was coming out to be 0 0.5 and, uh, and here I would just like to mention see uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is the corrected uh, vision actually. So what we did was we corrected the distance by minus 0 point, uh, by uh, minus 0 0.5 then he found out that his vision was 6-6 six, six, and he was corre getting corrected to N6. By correcting only the distance. Only the distance. So then well, based on that finding we uh, went to one uh, uh, power ahead like we went to the target refraction of minus 0 0.5 anything around minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.45 to minus 0 0.7 was the range and yeah target this refraction on IOL master. Is this with the SRKT or a Barrett which is the formula you used? We use the SRKT. Okay, thank you. 118.8 uh, is the optical yeah, A constant. Yeah, A constant is 118.8. So, uh, so based on that we found out that uh, the results were outstanding actually and uh, this is not something because I am in an Apasami uh, uh, session I am telling this thing I have after that I encouraged many of the staff patients also to un undergo this uh, get this IOL implanted and they are very happy. So I am personally very happy with this the basic key here is that the target refraction should be my around minus 0 0.5 to get the best outcome. Do not go for emetropic, do not go for the first myopic minus 0 0.1 or minus 0 0.2 that is the key and we had a fantastic result. As far as contrast sensitivity is concerned it was again very good it was uh, you know the normal log value is more than 1.48 so we had a mean value of 1.45, 1.46 that was quite good uh, considering it was a, um, an IOL inside the eye. Then distance stereoacuity was also within uh, very close to the normal and uh, this is what uh, was calculated by pupillometry the mean uh, mesopic pupil size was uh, 4.12 and 4.15 so on an average you can say 4.15 in these patients. Now once again I would say the mesopic pupil size of 4.15 is a very good pupil size so the patient selection is also very important if you have a mesopic pupil size of some people do have mesopic pupil size of uh, 6, 6.5 7, uh, I have seen such patients and they have been referred to me uh, that what to do whether we should do LASIK or whether we should do any procedure such patients are not good for uh, these lenses. So uh, I mean so uh, you can have good outcome if you do a good case selection also that is also important. As far as the higher order abrasion is concerned the coma was the mean coma uh, was 0 0.35 which was again a uh, good outcome as far as the higher order abrasion is concerned. So uh, I would uh, conclude here by saying that you know uh, we still have to analyze some more data actually uh, and uh, we also analyzed this all coma and trefoil this was calculated on eye trace and we have a whole uh, set of data unfortunately the, the analysis is not complete maybe uh, sometimes later I will be having the whole thing analyzed. But whatever I could figure out I could see that the uh, aberrations at with 5 millimeter pupil and aberrations with 3 millimeter pupil were uh, mostly comparable in this um, uh, at 4.5 and 3 millimeter were mostly comparable uh, with this eye wall. So that was a good thing that uh, you know that was quite encouraging uh, thing that we found out in this uh, with this eye wall. So this uh, the, the, the set of patients that we in included had good distance intermediate and near acuity, they had good contrast sensitivity, good stereoacuity and no significant photic phenomenon basically because of the design that, that has the dips inside and the rays are so, so you have limited uh, scattering and the aberrations were acceptable uh, 
uh, with 3 millimeter as well as 5 millimeter pupil size. Mildly better uh, abrasion control with 3 millimeter, but with 5 millimeter also there were few patients only who had uh, a significant abrasion. And the patient satisfaction was uh, really good. However, uh, we all know that with all these uh, lenses, we have to do good patient counseling. But uh, with all these, uh, we, we found out that, you know, by, if we ask the patient whether we, you will ask your relative to undergo, uh, to get this IOL, uh, almost uh, uh, every patient told that, yes, uh, we are happy and uh, we will ask our relatives to have this IOL. So, Particularly, I am myself very pleased uh, with the results uh, of uh, the IOL that we, the, that we implanted. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Uh, have you uh, do you have any experience of implanting in focus and shorter eyes uh, of less than 22 uh, axial length? No, not really, because uh, uh, so far we have done uh, this project and we uh, included only those patients who are absolutely within the physiological limits. So we wanted to have the results in you know, normal sized eye, normal cornea, no corneal pathology. So all those were excluding exclusion criteria uh, uh, while we were doing the projects. So I request Dr. Suveri to come and pick the lucky draw. Ah. We have two lucky draws to be given away. I request you to stay back to give the gifts. Dr. Vidya Devi M. from Bangalore. Is she here? Dr. Vidya Devi from Bangalore. And this is uh, Dr. Prashant Chak Chakrabarti. He's there. I request you to pick one more, sir. Uh, Dr. Ravi Shankar. Thank all the speakers and Apasami for organizing this session. I hand over the podium to the next symposium. Thank you. On behalf of Apasami, I thank all the speakers uh, for being with us here today. Dr. Kumaran, Dr. Rajeshina, Dr. Subira Jain, and Dr. Nivian.